By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are going to look at another match from the Four Horsemen Popper Tournament. So Four Horsemen, that means that all of these decks are made with cards from Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends and the Dark. And all these cards are popper cards, meaning they are all commons. Now we started this tournament with 50 wizards and now only 8 of them remain. We have reached the top 8 and in the top 8 we're going to look at John Dittert playing Desert Mechanics, a red and artifact deck. And he's taking on another red artifact deck, Fried Eggs. So this promises to be a super close match. I'm really looking forward to show you these decks and discuss the deck decks. But before I do, before I jump into the decks, I would just like to point out that if you want to skip the introduction, if you want to skip the deck decks, the easiest way to do that is by checking the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of these timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there. That will take you straight to the action. And also you can use the description below to find more information about this tournament and about the specific rule sets. And there's also a link to the tournament website. So if you like these decks, if you like this style of play, check out the tournament website because there you will find tons of deck photos and tons of information about the format. Okay, so now that you are fully informed, it means we are ready to move on to the next part of this video and that is the deck deck section. I'm gonna start with the deck by John Dittert, Desert Mechanics. And here we see the deck by John Dittert. So this is called Desert Mechanics, named after the card Desert and Orcish Mechanics. Maybe first kind of zoom into the card Desert. So Desert is a card from the Arabian Nights, a land. You can tap it for one mana, colorless mana. Uh, but you can also tap it to deal one damage to target attacking creature after it's dealt damage. So that means if your opponent is going to just attack with, let's say, a Savannah Alliance, you can simply kill it after taking the damage with your Desert. But there's, of course, some more synergy here with the Desert uh, strategy. For example, if you have that Orcish Mechanics on board, you can tap your Orcish Mechanics to sack an artifact and deal two damage to any target. So let's say your opponent is attacking with a 3-3 creature, uh, like a Moorish Cavalry, for example. You take the damage, then you deal one damage with your one Desert. After that, you use your Orcish Mechanics to sack an artifact, for example, a Felwer Stone, and then you can kill a three toughness creature. So the deserts are just kind of a nuisance, and I think they're particularly good in a common, a popper format, because they're just more creatures with a lower toughness, or at least so you would assume. So the more deserts you have, the harder it's going to be for the opponent to actually attack, because then you have to make a choice as the opponent. Okay, I can attack, but then I'll take damage from the desert, then I'll take damage maybe from the Orcish Mechanics, and then I'll slowly die. This kind of works nice with the card Immolation. So Immolation is an enchantment, an enchant creature from Legends. For one red, it gives plus two, minus two. So if you put this on a creature, it loses two of its uh, toughness power. And then of course, it's easier to kill with your desert, but also easier to kill with your Orcish Mechanics. So I kind of like the way that works. A card that's quite popular in this format, for example, the Azure Drake, you can put this on the Azure Drake, and then it becomes a four, two instead of a two, four. And then you can kill it with your Orcish Mechanics by sacking an artifact. So I kind of like this. It also goes quite well with another all-star in the format, uh, in the format, Pyrotechnics. So Pyrotechnics is one red and four, and deals four damage divided any way you choose. And you know this is kind of ideal with cards like Immolation or cards like Orcish Mechanics, right? You can kind of choose to deal one damage there, one damage there, two damage there, and then by casting your Immolation and using your Orcish Mechanics the right way, you can probably kill some more creatures. So you get ultimate value out of your pyrotechnics. And pyrotechnics has just been an absolute all-star. Now, when we're looking at the rest of the deck, we can see it's really artifact heavy. For example, we've got Primal Clay here, a very good creature in the format. Four to cast, uh, it can be a 2-2 two -two flyer, a 3-3 three -three ground creature, or a 1-6 wall. In most situations, you will choose to uh, go for the 2-2 two -two flyer because that's just top evasion. There are not that many flyers in the format. So having a 2-2 two -two flyer for four is actually pretty good, especially a 2-2 two -two flyer that doesn't necessarily always have to be a 2-2 two -two flyer. And remember um, what John can do, or he can always get value out of his artifacts as long as he has an Orcish Mechanics on board, right? So in response to, for example, the opponent trying to play a Divine Offering on one of his artifacts, he can always tap his Orcish Mechanics, sack the artifact, and at least deal two damage to any target. So he always gets some kind of uh, value out of it. Another card that's surprisingly good in this format is Dragon Engine. Dragon Engine, three to cast for a one, three creature, 
and for two you can give it plus one plus oh and you can do that as many times as you want and that's exactly kind of the key here in uh in the reason that the dragon engine is so powerful because these games tend to take quite long and the longer they take the more mana you have the bigger your uh, dragon engine can be so your opponent is kind of forced to every time block that dragon engine and it's kind of hard to kill it because it's got the three toughness so well unless of course your opponent is playing with red which tim edwood actually is so i think tim has got quite some weapons against the dragon engine in the form of course of chain lightnings and pyrotechnics but apart from that the card is really difficult to get rid of and like I said, the fact that you can pump it up is a lot better than you might think and a lot better than in a lot of other old school formats. So Dragon Engine is really a card to kind of keep in the bag of your, of your mind. And then we see some nice cards here in the sideboard that are going to be relevant. We see, for example, three Mountain Yetis. Mountain Yeti, a 3-3, protection from white, not relevant at all. But look at that other part on this card. It's got Mountain Walk, and that's going to be great, you know, because Tim, he's playing with a lot of red. We also see Artifact Blasts in the sideboard. They could be useful as well. Okay, now that we've looked at the deck of John, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, uh, Tim's Fried Eggs. And here we see the deck Fried Eggs by Tim Edwood. And maybe you're a little bit confused because at the end of episode three, I showed you the deck of Tom Edwood and I said Tom Edwood was going to play in the top eight. But no, it is not Tom, it is Tim. You have to understand they're brothers. I mixed up the deck photos, so I'm sorry if you got confused. But the top eight match is with Tim Atwood playing this deck, Fried Eggs. And in this deck, we see, of course, a combo that we see a lot in this format because it's one of the coolest combos that you can legally play in Four Horsemen Popper. And that is Chain Lightning and Rook Egg. So Rook Egg, one red and three to cast for an 0-3 uh, creature. And if it dies, at the end of your turn, you get a 4-4 Flying Bird token. And if you combine this with Chain Lightning, what you can do is you can play your Chain Lightning on your own Rook Egg then you can play, uh, pay two red and use the chain lightning to deal three damage to another target, for example, to a creature of your opponent or to your opponent, or a dream scenario, you have another Rook Egg you can kill with it, you know, and that means you get another 4-4 flyer at the end. So Rook Egg chain lightning is a really good combination and kind of continuing on that Rook Egg train, we also see four Bloodlusts. So Bloodlust gives plus four, uh, minus four, and the toughness cannot go be, uh, below one. So if you play this on a Rook Egg, you would get a 4-1 Rook Egg. And that's of course quite nice because then you can attack with your Rook Egg and if your opponent doesn't block, fine, you can deal four damage. If your opponent does block, you can play the Bloodlust and it kills quite easily. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of works. Also, you can use, of course, your Bloodlust in combination with a Pyrotechnics. Pyrotechnics, an all-star card. We already discussed it in the deck of John. But of course, that four damage that you can divide any way you please means, you know, if you've played a Bloodlust that turn over your Rook Egg, you can just ping it for one with your Pyrotechnics and you still have three damage to use however you want to. So you don't even lose a card to that. You know, you only lose one damage, you only lose a fourth of the power of the pyrotechnics and you get a 4-4 flyer back. So that's quite good. Talking about that one damage, he also plays with Immolation. Immolation, a card that gives plus two, minus two, an enchant creature from Legends. Put that on your Rook Egg and all of a sudden you've got uh, a 2-1 Rook Egg. So that's also pretty nice because of course, when you attack your opponent's like, I'm not going to block it because I don't want you to have a 4-4 flyer. But how long can your opponent afford to do that if you keep dealing two points of damage every turn? So you're kind of putting your opponent in a difficult position. Now, um, what really is uh, uh, strikes me in this deck is that uh, Tim is playing with sideboard cards mainboard. And what I'm talking about here are the Desert Nomads and the Mountain Yetis. Now, Desert Nomads is a super cool card. It hasn't been reprinted. It's got Desert Walk and is immune to damage dealt by deserts. Now, John is playing with the full playset of deserts. So Desert Nomads are, I think, super, super good in this matchup and can bring John in some serious trouble. And usually you see these cards played in sideboard if you see them being played at all. But in the deck of Tim, they are main. So that's definitely a meta call from Tim. Another meta call is by playing with Mountain Yeti main. Um, red, it is one of the strongest colors, probably the strongest color in Four Horsemen Popper. So it makes sense to play Mountain Yeti main because it's got mountain walk. And in worst case scenario, your opponent doesn't have mountains, then it still is a 3-3 body on the floor for four, which is not too bad in this format. And also it's got protection from white. So... You know, there are reasons to play it main, but still most of the time you see people playing it sideboard. 
really nice to see it main in this deck we also see dragon engines just like in the deck of john as i already said these cards are stronger than you think we also see four jalem tomes i completely understand why a jalem tome is one of the only cards to kind of go through your deck quicker right than just waiting on your draw step so jalem tome three to cast for an artifact from antiquities two and tap draw a card and immediately immediately discard a card now these games tend to take quite long and when games take long you tend to draw lands right when you don't need them with jalem tome you can go through your deck a little bit quicker you can discard those um abundance of lands and get useful cards back in return so i kind of like that um then when we're looking at the sideboard what i see here are uh the two artifact blasts I think they are going to be very useful here against the deck of John Dittard. So those two cards are definitely going to go in. Perhaps the Desert Nomad and Mountain Yeti number four are also going to go in. And maybe even the Goblins of the Flark. Although, you know, John is playing with Empyrotechnics and Desert. So probably it's not going to make its way in the deck. But, you know, they do have Mountain Walk. So he could consider doing that. Okay, this is the deck of Tim. We've already looked at the deck of John. That means we're ready. John versus Tim. Top 8, 4 Horsemen Popper. Let's go! Game number 1 of the top 8 of the 4 Horsemen Popper tournament. Here we go. John Dittert on the play playing uh, Mono Red with Artifacts. Taking on Tim Edwood who's also playing Mono Red with Artifacts. Red is just really strong in this format. John starting with a Felwerstone in turn 2. Passing turn to Tim. Let's see what Tim can do here. Playing a Mountain and a Pass. So John's deck is called um, Desert Mechanics, and he's now playing a Yoshin Soldier, a 1-4 creature from the Antiquities expansion. And uh, when you attack, you don't have to tap it, so it's got Vigilance. And Tim is playing with the deck, he's called Fright Egg, so he's playing with Rook Egg and Chain Lightnings. And uh, let's see if Tim has a land drop. John just missed his land drop, by the way. He's kind of stuck, but he, had, he could ramp up with the Velver Stone, so at least he's got three mana sources. There we see a desert being played by Tim. Tapping three here. There's a Jalem Tome, so the little book. Three to cast, two and tap, draw a card, discard a card. Passing turn to John. John finding another mountain. And he's just going to attack for one here. So Tim dropping to 19. Can he put some more pressure on the board? That's the big question. He is going to tap three. Okay, also finding a Jalem Tome in the past turn. So Jalem Tome's super handy. They allow you to kind of go through your deck, finding the cards you need and dumping the cards you don't need. Let's see if Tim can do something. Or is he going to use his Jalem Tome to draw a card and discard a card? That's, of course, an option as well. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank here, trying to think what to do. The, the good good news for Tim is there's not a lot of pressure on the board. There's just that one Yoshin soldier that's attacking for one. So, I mean, if you're doubting between taking damage or drawing a card using the Jalem, I would definitely use the Jalem. Tapping two red here, casting a Felwer Stone. Okay, this is quite nice because now he can still use the Jalem Tome on end step with John here. You know, and he's going to take a damage, but that doesn't really matter. It's just one damage. He's going to drop to 18. It's not the end of the world. So there's the attack and John finding a land again. So he's going to go up to four lands, having five mana. Going to tap four. Oh, playing a clay statue. So clay statue, a 3-1 creature. Two and tap, uh, sorry, two to regenerate. And this is quite interesting. I mean, John could have considered waiting another turn before playing the clay statue because then he would also have enough mana to regenerate the clay statue if need be. Remember, Tim is playing... With, for example, the Pyrotechnics. Also, Immolation, by the way, is a great card to get rid of uh, creatures with regeneration. So you could also play uh, an Immolation here on the Clay Statue. Tim, of course, using his Jalem Tome here on end step of John. Discarding the Fisher. Interesting. Fisher, a really good card. So Tim must have a pretty good hand here that he's um, throwing away the Fisher. Fisher buries target creature or destroys a land. A really good card. A card from the dark. There we see a Chain Lightning. On the clay statue. Now, unfortunately, John cannot regenerate, so the clay statue dies. And there we see a dragon engine and a pass turn. So, dragon engine, a 1 3 creature from antiquities, 2, and now uh, you can give it plus 1 plus 0. Oh. 
There is a chain lightning on the dragon engine and an attack by the ocean soldier. Tim dropping here to 17. And both players now have more than enough land to kind of start doing what they want to do. So two cards in hand for John and I believe also two cards in hand for Tim, although I'm not quite sure. And Tim tapping three here and he's going to cast Desert Nomads. Okay, the card we talked about in the deck deck, Desert Nomads is a creature with desert walk and with protection from deserts. And we see John has a desert. There's an immolation though, and that means it dies. It's a two, two, so immolation gives it plus two, minus two, so it dies. And again, the attack by the ocean soldier. Tim is playing with three desert nomads, so he can find another one. Again, drawing a card and discarding a card, this time discarding the Jalem Tome. So both players kind of keeping each other in balance with the big difference that John has that Yoshin Soldier. That Yoshin Soldier now has dealt three damage. That is pretty impressive for Yoshin Soldier. So Tim is on 16 and John is still on 20. I wonder what Tim's going to do with all that mana. I believe he's got two cards in hand if I'm not mistaken. Tapping four, perhaps for a Mountain Yeti. Okay, first playing a land, tapping four. Oh, there's a Rook Egg. Of course, playing with a full place of Rook Eggs. Oh, look at that. Tim has a lot more cards in hand than I thought he did. That's good news for Tim. He's got three cards in hand. Also, three cards for John, by the way. So now he's going to go to card number four. Well, first he's going to draw a card and discard a card on end step here. This is exactly what you want to do with the Jalem Tome. Just get optimal volume, uh, sorry, value, and uh, discard those cards you don't need, like this desert. If Tim now has an immolation, that would be kind of ideal. He can start attacking. He is attacking. Maybe we're going to see a bloodlust. I don't think John is going to block here. I can't imagine. And we're probably going to see a bloodlust or not, or just Tim is going to say, okay, whatever. So we're going to go in second main, it seems. Although I'm not quite sure. I think we are now in second main. Tim's tapping three. Okay, playing a Dragon Engine. And playing a Chain Lightning. Ooh, this is interesting. And now he can get that value out. Although he doesn't want to send it to John. Because if he does, John can send it back. So this is just to kill the Rook Egg so that Tim will get a 4-4 Flying Bird token at the end step. There we see the 4-4 Flying Bird. And John, of course, using his Jalem Tome on end step. Now, what would have happened if Tim would have sent the Chain Lightning to John? John could have sent it back and kill the, uh, the Dragon Engine. So I think it probably would have been better for Tom to perhaps first... Ooh, Fisher here on the 4-4 Bird token to perhaps first play the Chain Lightning... On his Rook Egg, deal 3 damage to John, perhaps take 3 damage back, and after that, all that whole thing resolved, then play the Dragon Engine out. Then again, Tim, of course, is on a lower life amount. So, I, under I understand this line of play as well. There we see Tim discarding a red, drawing a card. Like I said, Dragon Engine is better than you may think. And he can already pump it up now to a 4-3, actually killing the Yoshin Soldier if he would attack. So... Could be interesting for Tim to attack here. Then again, Tim is on the lower life total, so maybe he's kind of choosing the role as the more passive player here. Two cards in hand for John. I'm not quite sure how many cards uh, Tim now has at the moment. He does have six untapped lands. Putting his hand away, so I think he's not going to do anything. Okay, taking his hand back. Exactly, he's first going to attack. Remember, he can pump his Dragon Engine to a 4-3 creature. So I think John is not going to block. I think he's just going to let it go. And then we see one pump, so two damage here for John. John finally taking some damage. So he's going to drop to 18. And that's about it. So no play from Tim here, second main. That is quite interesting. That means he could have pumped it up. 
for an extra point of damage and still keep two open for the Jalem Tome, but maybe he had his reasons. He's first taking a damage by the Brave Yoshin Soldier. That's damage number five for the Yoshin Soldier. Let's see if John can do anything else. Tapping four, playing a clay statue, and now he does have that mana open to regenerate the clay statue. There we see the activation of the Jalem Tome by Tom, uh, by Tim. Sorry, on end step of John. Untapping now. So this is a pretty interesting game one. Both players having a book, and both players kind of having a lot of similar creatures in their deck. They both play with Dragon Engine, for example. I wonder if Tom can find any of his Mountain Yetis. Remember, he's playing with three of those main, and they're really, really strong against the deck of John because of those mountains. Both players also playing with red, meaning they have access to pyrotechnics, they have access to chain lightning, they have access, um, you know, to immolation. So they've got access to Fisher, of course. So they've got access to a lot of removal. Tim on 15, and he's attacking here with the Dragon Engine. Let's see what John's going to do. Look, it looks like John is having some issues with his phone here. Oh, there Tim showing his hand. I believe we saw four cards in hand there for Tim. There is the block. So he can regenerate. But then, of course, after regeneration... So that means he's going to lose the Dragon Engine. I'm expecting some type of removal from Tim here to get rid of the Clay Statue. Pyrotechnics could work and then deal three damage. Okay, there we see a Pyrotechnics and then three damage on the life total of John probably. There is a second red and a pass turn. So that second land is kind of second red is kind of important for Tim because that allows him to use the Jalem Tome on end step. Another damage dealt by the Yoshin Soldier. I'm starting to be, become a really big fan of this Yoshin Soldier. He's definitely the MVP of the game thus far. There we see a primal clay, and that's going to be turned into a. It's hard to see, I believe. I'm just gonna assume it's a 2-2 flyer. And there we see, of course, the Jalum activation. Tim dumping a land there. Discarding a land, I should say. Because of the Jalum activation. Now, what can he do? Tapping the Felwar. There's the Immolation. Yep, taking care of the 2-2 Flyer. The Primal Clay is a goner. Tapping four. There's the Mountain Yeti. Yes, this is what I expected him to do. These Mountain Yetis are so strong. Three damage every time they attack and unblockable because of that Mountain Walk. This is tough for John. But remember, both players have a lot of removal. Are we going to see a Chain? Yep, there's the Chain Lightning. <laughs> it's not tough for John at all. So he's getting rid of the Mountain Yeti. And then he can attack again with the Yoshin Soldier, inflicting damage number seven from Mr. Yoshin. He is the Michael Jordan of this game. There we see a tap for three and second main. And there's the Orcish Mechanics. And Orcish Mechanics is quite nice. Remember, tap, sacrifice an artifact, deal two damage to any target. I always kind of feel like they should have made the Orcish Mechanics a 1-2 or maybe even a 1-3. I mean, it's three mana to cast for this creature. And instead, it's just a 1-1, one, one, so it's super vulnerable. Let's hope for John that it can stick. Tim being on 13 at the moment, by the way. John on 15. Looks like he's going to use his Jalem Tome in his main phase. Trying to find something useful. Again, discarding a land card. F 
Five mana open, putting his hand away. Does that mean that he's passing turn? Yeah, also passing turn. Two cards in hand for Tim. John also using his Jalen Tillman end step, of course. Two cards in hand for him as well. So both players have two cards in hand. But of course, John has two creatures on the board. Not attacking with the mechanics. Quite interesting. That means he wants to keep it untapped to maybe use it in response to something. There we see another Yoshin Soldier. And these Yoshin Soldiers are quite good. The four toughness makes them pretty tough to, to kill. And also when you're the opponent and you have a kill spell, you probably go for another creature because it only has one power, so it only deals one point of damage. But so far that one Yoshin Soldier has dealt eight points of damage. That's quite a lot here. Tapping a red. There's an immolation, probably on the Orcish Mechanics. He's going to use it in response, throw his Felwer Stone at Tim. Tim's going to drop to 10. So Tim is, is, you know, slowly but surely going down in life. There we see a Mountain Yeti by Tim. And now John can attack with both Yoshins. He's probably going to block one. That means one more damage for Tim is going to drop to 9. Because Tim is completely tapped out, so there's not really a way out of this situation. Of course, he could consider not blocking it. Perhaps he's afraid of a bloodlust, for example. So he has to decide, am I going to take the extra point of damage or am I going to take the risk? Looking at his one card in hand. Asking how many cards he's played out. So he's really in the tank here. Taking the risk. I think it's a good decision because he's getting quite low. Or else you're going to drop to 8. Tapping 3 here. Okay, there's another Orcish Mechanics. And a pass. Only one card in hand for John. I wonder what that is. Two cards in hand now for Tim. And it's getting tough for Tim here, you know. If he attacks, okay, he can deal 3 points of damage. But he's on 9 himself. Does he really want to take, you know, a double Yoshin Soldier... And perhaps also the mechanics, that would mean he would drop to 6. He needs to get rid of some of these creatures or just get another blocker in. A Dragon Engine, for example, would be quite nice as well. A Rook Egg would be, uh, would be okay. Not ideal, though, because of the 3 toughness. It can only block a Yoshin Soldier and it won't die, so you won't get your bird token. So there's the attack. So John dropping to 12. Five mana. For a moment there, I thought he was going to cast something big, but he's uh, putting it back. Five mana again. Are we going to see Pyrotechnics? There we see a Pyrotechnics dealing three damage to John. So John's now also on nine and killing the Orcish Mechanics. Quite interesting. There we see John activating the Tome, discarding the Felwer Stone. So he can attack for two, put Tim on seven. Looking at his hand, two cards in hand for John. Looks like he's really doubting what to do. Tapping for another Primal Clay. So I guess that's a 2-2 flyer again. Because of the immolation, she could consider making it a 3-3. But then it doesn't have evasion, of course. So there's the untap by Tim, and Tim keeps just dumping those lands. And this is exactly why the Jalen Tome is so good. Later in the game, like right now, you don't want to have those lands. You want to have something useful. So you discard the lands. And if, you're, uh, if you have a Jalen Tome early game and you cannot find your lands, again, the Jalen Tome is useful to discard your bigger spells and try to find land drops. So Tim is, is, is still in a rough spot because next turn, if he attacks with the AD, he has no blockers, he will take four damage. And if he keeps the AD home, I mean, he will only have, that will only save him one damage. So it's tough, you know. John is on nine. So, you know, putting him on six could be worth the attack and taking the extra damage. But then he's going to drop to three, which makes him vulnerable to chain lightning. So perhaps that's a reason not to attack. So one card in hand for John here. It's still Tim's turn. What is he going to do?
Looks like he's going to activate the Jalem Tome, trying to find something more useful. Then the question is, what is he going to discard? Okay, throwing away a land. That's kind of an easy discard. Has he found something useful? He, there is the attack, so perhaps he has. Oh, a Bloodlust! John's going to drop to seven. Sorry, to two. He's going to take seven points of damage. Wow. There we see a Desert Nomads. All of a sudden, the tables have turned. John has a huge problem. Looking at two creatures he cannot block. Remember, Desert Nomads has Desert Walk. John is on two. He's got Mountain Yeti and Desert Nomads. Of course, he's going to draw another card. He needs to find a solution. It looked like John was winning this for the longest of time, but now Tim is coming back with the Bloodlust play and the Desert Nomads. That's it! Tim's going to win this game number one with Mountain Yeti and Desert Nomads. <laughs> wow, I really thought, John, you had this game. But it ain't over till it's over. Okay, this was game number one. Both players are going to dive into their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. So John on the left, Tim on the right. John, of course, on the play after losing that first game. But John, you were so close. After sideboarding, anything can happen. Although I'm a little bit concerned because Tim can board in his Mountain Yeti number four. He can board in his um, Desert Nomad number four. And both players now probably having access to Artifact Blasts also coming in from the sideboard. And there we see Tim playing a Felwer Stone in the pass. John playing land number three. There's a Yoshin Soldier. But there is an Artifact Blast from the sideboard. So a card from the Antiquities expansion, one red, and it just counters an Artifact. It is pretty useful. There we see a Mountain Yeti. An Artifact Blast has gained a little bit um, in popularity in normal uh, old school formats uh, because of the uh, Triskelion. There we see a um, Dragon Engine by John, by the way, and a Mountain Yeti being taken away earlier by a Chain Lightning, another cha Chain Lightning by Tim. I mean, both players just have a lot of removal, so it's going to be creature, removal or not. If not, deal a little bit of damage. If there's removal, just it's just going to go. There we see a Desert Nomad, but no Desert from John. So perhaps John, I wonder if he's kept the Deserts in. I wonder. He probably needs them for the mana base, right? But it is quite risky playing your deserts against a player who's got Desert Nomads. There we see a Dragon Engine by John, by the way, and that uh, Desert Nomads is a 2-2, so probably is not going to attack. Or maybe Tim has some kind of combat trick and he wants to attack with it, wants to make the trade with the Dragon Engine. I wonder if you're John, what you should do here. Yeah, I think I would probably just take the damage because Dragon Engine is just too good to kind of trade here. On the other hand, it is then a two for one, so it's not too bad. So let's see what John can do. Okay, he is playing a desert, interesting. There's the attack. He can pump it to a 3-3. Doesn't do. Just dealing one damage. Or are we going to see something being cast by John, your second main? Could play out his Mountain Yeti. Playing a Primal Clay instead. Is it going to be a 2-2 flyer or a 3-3? Now it's going to be a 3-3 creature. I kind of understand this move. That means that if, you know, if Tim attacks, he can uh, deal 3 damage with his Primal Clay. Remember, the uh, Desert Nomads is has desert uh, walk, so it cannot be blocked because John has that desert on board. Let's see if Tim has any kind of removal, and if so, where he wants to spend it on, on the Dragon Engine or the Primal Clay. Tim playing another land, tapping five here, playing a Fisher on the Primal Clay. And passing turn here. So John dropping to 16 after taking another hit from the Desert Nomads. There is an Immolation on the Nomads, killing the Nomads on the spot. There is an attack. He's going to pump it up. No, he's not. He's going to play a Mountain Yeti instead. For a moment there, I thought he was pumping it up, but just dealing one point of damage and playing a Mountain Yeti. So pressure for Tim Atwood here. 
He's on 18. John's on 16. Tapping the Felber Stone, playing an Immolation. Ooh, and a Pyrotechnics. This is what we talked about in the deck deck, and here you can see it in action. So the Immolation gives plus two, minus two. For example, making the Mountain Yeti into a 5-1. Then he plays his Pyrotechnics, three damage on the Dragon Engine, one damage on the Mountain Yeti, and that's ultimate value. I mean, in the end, I guess it's two cards for two cards, but still, it is really nice to see. And here we see... A Desert Nomads hitting the board by Tim Atwood. John's found a Jalum Tome, by the way. Giving him some uh, card selection options. Tapping five. Okay. Dealing two damage to Tim and two damage to the Desert Nomads. So both players are just going to continue to kill each other's creatures. There is a Rook Egg. Would be quite nice for Tim if he can now find another Immolation, put that on a Rook Egg and start dealing some damage to John. John tapping four here for a Mountain Yeti coming in from the sideboard. I wonder if Tim is going to attack here. Why not? I mean, he might as well just tap the Rook Egg. Who knows what's going to happen? The Mountain Yeti is unblockable anyway because of that Mountain Walk. So Tim um, weighing off his options. What is he going to do here? Looks like he wants to tap the Felwer for an Immolation. Okay, here's that Immolation we talked about. He's going to attack. It's now a 2-1. What are you going to do when you're John? I mean, are you going to go to 14? He is going to go to 14. Doesn't want to give Tim that 4-4 flyer. Tim tapping five, ooh, playing a Pyrotechnics, and again, getting the value out of those Pyrotechnics. Killing his Rook Egg after he's dealt the damage and killing the Mountain Yeti. Pyrotechnics is such an all-star in this format. I'm just going to keep saying it. He will see a quick Fisher, by the way, on the bird. So both players are back to square one with no creatures. I guess John is a slight favorite because he's got the Jalem Tome. And we see Tim is on 16, John's on 14. There we see John using the Jalem Tome, probably trying to find a creature that he can cast, discarding his other Jalem Tome, tapping three. There's an Orcish Mechanics and passing turn. Orcish Mechanics, of course, just a 1-1, one -one, so very vulnerable to removal. I wonder what Tim's going to do here. Looks like he's really in the tank. Not sure how many cards he's got in hand. We see two cards for John. I kind of would expect uh, Tim to have the same amount of cards. Considering both players are playing out the same amount of spells. Okay, here we go. He's got three cards in hand. He was on the play, so that makes sense. John now having three cards in hand as well after his draw. I do feel the Rook Egg is quite nice in this matchup. Tim now drawing card number four. Can he find a way to kill his own Rook Egg and get a 4-4 bird token? One of the lines of play could be, if he has it, of course, Chain Lightning on his own Rook Egg. Pay two red, Chain Lightning on the Orcish Mechanist. And then John can choose if he wants to send the Chain Lightning back. If he does, fine. Tim can just send it back as well, deal three damage to the life total of John. So actually, a Chain Lightning would be really, really good in this scenario. And Tim really in the tank here. Remember, this is a top eight match. And if Tim loses his, this game, he is out of the tournament. All his dreams, all his hopes of becoming the pauper four horsemen champion are then out of the window as well. So it makes sense that he's taking his time. There is the bloodlust. So dealing four points of damage to John, that means he would drop to 10. And he does so, of course. I mean, in response, he could have 
For example, sack the Jalen Tome, kill the Rook Egg, but that would be pretty devastating because then Tim, okay, he wouldn't deal any damage, but he would get a 4-4 bird in return. And of course, John would lose a very powerful artifact. So I think this is a good decision by Tom. Uh, sorry, by John. So John being on 10, Tim being on 16. Two cards in hand for Tim. Okay, now playing the Immolation. It's really nice to see Tim kind of using this car these cards exactly the way that they're, you know, meant to be used in his type of deck. There's just a lot of synergy going on, and I really enjoy looking at it. All the little trickery that he does with Immolation, Pyrotechnics, Bloodlust. It's quite nice. John finding another desert, desert number three, Pyrotechnics taking care of the bird token. I just got to laugh because these players keep removing each other's creatures and they're so creative at trying to create some value for themselves. But every time it ends up in the other player simply destroying the creature. There's a Jalen Tome for Tim, one card in hand. Is he going to use the Jalen Tome immediately? No, he's not. He's going to pass turn. There we see John again using Jalen Tome on end step of Tim, discarding a, a mountain, using the Jalen Tome again. So I guess he's got a lot of lands in hand. Five mana open still to cast. There's a Yoshin Soldier. There's an attack with the Orc, putting Tim here on 14. And there we see Tim using the Jalen Tome, discarding a Felwer Stone and taking on his turn now. Going to draw card number two. So two cards in hand for Tim. He's on 14. John on 10. There's a Mountain Yeti. That's a good card. Does John have an answer for this Mountain Yeti? That is the question. One of the things he can do now is attack with the Yoshin. If Tim blocks, he can, after damage is dealt in second main, throw the Yoshin Soldier to the 80, but Tim knows this probably, just takes the damage, gonna go to 13, there we see Tim playing a 3-3 creature in the form of a Primal Clay, and passing turn, there we see Tim again using the Jalen Tome on end step. The nice thing, by the way, I didn't see that yet, is that John Dittert has three deserts. That means that if Tim attacks, John can actually kill the Mountain Yeti with his deserts. This is really sweet. So I guess the Mountain Yeti of Tim is now on blocking duty. If Tim can find a fisher, he could consider fishering one of the deserts. But that's not really what you want to do. So here we finally see John getting some value from his deserts. Because I kind of feel that he wasn't really that lucky with the deserts. As a matter of fact, they kind of worked against him at the moment that Tim could find a desert nomad to play. But now these three deserts are looking quite powerful against that Mountain Yeti. Tim, two cards in hand, a little bit, you know, looking at the board, contemplating what to do next. Does he really want, want to attack? I, I think if you're, if you're Tim, you don't want to. Perhaps, you know, if he's got, for example, a Bloodlust in hand, then you can consider attacking because you deal 7 damage with one blow and you put him on 3, and then if you can find your direct damage, it's the game's over. You know, so there are definitely scenarios here where it's good to attack, but if, if all that he can do is attack and then lose the Mountain Yeti for just 3 points of damage, I wouldn't attack. He is attacking here. Interesting. Does that mean that he's got something? No, he does not. So... John dropping to seven. Mountain Yeti is dead. I mean, I guess in the way that this makes sense is that Mountain Yeti wasn't very good as a blocker anyway because he could block the Ocean Soldier, but then after damage is dealt in the second main, uh, John can use his Orcish Mechanics to throw that same Ocean Soldier to the Mountain Yeti, dealing those two extra points of damage. And you don't want to trade it for the Primal Clay. Or at least... I guess you don't want to trade it for the Primal Clay. So it's interesting because he is opening himself up now to a lot of damage. He's on 13, so he would take at least 4 points of damage. Maybe John's also going to attack with the Mechanics. Then it would mean 5 points of damage. He would drop to 8. But let's just kind of see what John is now going to do. Yeah, he's going to attack, dealing 4 points. He's going to drop to 9. So Tim on 9, John on 7. So both players pretty, you know, 
on an equal level life total, but of course John has a lot more creatures. But remember that game number one where John also had the upper hand, but Tim ended up winning it. So Tim drawing a card, he's going to discard a card again. There is a desert in the bin. Tapping five. There's a pyrotechnic. So much value on the life total here. And a chain lightning. It's over. <laughs> and now I understand the attack with the 80. Now I get the attack with the 80. And that's, I think that is, of course, something, and I've said it before you're on the channel, it's really easy to look at these games and say, oh, I would do this, oh, I would do that. But listen up, you don't know what's in their hands, you don't know the decks that well, you haven't played with the decks that often. That being said, of course, for me as a commentator, I'm gonna share my opinion with you, but please keep in the back of your head that I don't have the information the players have, and I don't have, you know, the experience with playing their decks, you know? So please take all that into consideration when you're listening to my nonsense. Talking about that, thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks. And of course, a big congratulations to Tim Atwood for moving on with his deck, Fried Eggs. Wow, what a match. So again, congratulations to Tim. And uh, the good news is if you enjoyed this tournament, if you like the matches, um, next week we have another episode with a match uh, from this tournament. And this time we are going to look at these two decks. We have Tom Atwood, the brother of Tim, who's playing uh, with his deck Burning Skies. And he's taking on MTG Phil. And he's playing with Ape Attack with Barbary Apes and Kurt Apes and Jared of the Close Fist. I'm just really looking forward to seeing that deck in action, but also the deck of, uh, of Tom is absolutely stunning. So that's it's, uh, going to be a very, very close match. So we have that for you next week, Tuesday. Now, before you go, I would just like to ask you to do a few things to help the channel out. The first thing is to like this episode. Please do so, it really, really helps. It tells YouTube that you appreciate my content. Also, you can comment and of course, share this on your socials. It's completely free and it really helps the channel move forward. And if you're new to the channel, welcome to old school. Please subscribe and ring that bell. And now that you've done all of that, there's just one last thing that I would like to tell you before you go away. And that is that Timmy Talks also has a Patreon page. And the Patreon is super important for the channel because it's a way for the viewers like yourself to support Timmy Talks financially and help me to keep doing what I am doing. So please consider visiting the Timmy Talks Patreon page and consider becoming a supporter. It already starts with $1 and for that dollar, you actually get a lot back. You can join the Timmy Talks tournaments like this one. You get access to the exclusive Timmy Talks Discord where you can chat with all the other patrons. And last but not least, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video. What end scroll? This end scroll. Somebody can see.